So today, we're gonna take a look at Battletoads. Throughout the 1980s, Nintendo dominated the video game industry. In case you couldn't tell by the prior videos in this series covering mostly Nintendo games. At the beginning of 1990, they held 90% of the American market share for video games. There was no competition. The NES had saved video games from irrelevance in the West, and as far as anyone was concerned, they were the top of the industry, with nobody in second place. But while Nintendo claimed domain over American living rooms, another company held sway over the classic arcades, Sega. The Hawaii-formed company began as Service Games, a pinball machine manufacturer during World War II, and this had extended to arcade video game cabinets as the decades passed. But Sega had also tried their hand at the home video game market, with consoles such as the SG-1000 and the Master System. Even still, there was no topping Nintendo. 16-bit arcade graphics. In 1988, Sega launched its first 16-bit console, the Mega Drive, known as the Genesis in North America. This console launched a full two years ahead of Nintendo's Super NES, and in that time, the Genesis was beginning to take more and more of Nintendo's market share. Games such as Fantasy Star were somewhat modest successes, and the Genesis was also known for its strong sports game lineup. And as Nintendo continued to drag their feet on creating a successor to the NES, Sega began to feel like they needed a game that could represent the backbone of their company. Until the 90s, the closest thing Sega had to an official mascot was Alex Kidd. The first Alex Kidd game actually began development as a tie-in game for the Dragon Ball franchise, but when licensing rights fell through, it was reworked to be a more generic Journey to the West adaptation instead, this being the folktale Dragon Ball originally took inspiration from to begin with. But as Alex Kidd saw a few more sequels and found somewhat of an identity of his own, it became clear that he didn't have what it takes to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mario. Sega needed a fresh take on a mascot. They needed something that could shake up the industry. They needed their first million seller, something that could be a phenomenon. They needed their own Mario killer. In late 1989, Sega began running an internal contest for employees to submit ideas for a new mascot character. Of these early ideas, favorites included an armadillo that could attack by rolling into a ball, a rabbit that could extend its ears to grab items, and a bulldog with blue jeans and sunglasses. Character designer Naoto Oshima, during a business trip in New York, took to the streets with mock-ups of these character designs, showing various passerby the drawings and asking which one most appealed to them. While there were quite a few fans of the bulldog, there were two clear winners in this impromptu poll. A rotund, mustachioed man wearing pajamas, and the winner, by a very clear margin, a spiky little critter known then only as Mr. Hedgehog. Sega of Japan higher-ups agreed that the Hedgehog character was their best bet, and a team of 15 from Sega's AM2 division would be chosen to lead development on the game that would be the character's official debut. Of this 15-man team, three would lead the charge. The aforementioned Naoto Oshima would design the characters, Hirokazu Yasuhara would map out the levels, and now-convicted criminal and all-around petty asshole Yuji Naka would be lead programmer. The character's finalized design would take inspiration from classic cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse and Felix the Cat, with shoes and personality inspired by Michael Jackson and, uh, Bill Clinton. Yeah. It was decided that the character would be colored blue to match Sega's logo, and his shoes were made red and white to evoke the same colors as the most famous person in the world, Santa Claus. And this also coincidentally resulted in the character having the same three colors as the American flag, red, white, and blue. As far as Sega Japan were concerned, if this game could be popular in America, that popularity would spread throughout the rest of the world. To act as the arch-villain to our hero, Oshima would also redesign the well-received mustachioed character into an evil scientist to act as the foil to our spiky protagonist. While this conceptualization was reaching its final stages, Nintendo would finally launch their 16-bit competitor to the Genesis, the Super NES. While Nintendo's console was more advanced than the Genesis in many ways, thanks to it being made a few years later, no doubt, the Genesis still had a clear lead in one specific aspect, its speedy processor. Fortuitously, the AM2 team had already decided that their game should focus on a character whose very basis was that he was faster than anyone else and Yuji Naka's very savvy programming talents and love of sports cars would make this possible. To compose the game's music, Masato Nakamura, of the popular Japanese band Dreams Come True, would be brought onto the team, and the band would promote the game during their latest tour. Everything was in motion for Sega's Mario Killer to take the world by storm. And on June 23, 1991, the world would finally meet Sonic 
the Hedgehog. Yep, wait, hold on, sorry. Why does the attract mode start so goddamn soon? It's like a anti-Mega Man 3. Okay, there we go. Sonic the Hedgehog follows the eponymous hero as he ventures to rescue the idyllic South Island from the industrializing hand of the evil Dr. Robotnik, otherwise known as Eggman, who is using helpless animals to power his robots while he searches for the mysterious Chaos Emeralds, which are said to hold great power. It's up to Sonic to free his animal friends, keep the Chaos Emeralds out of evil hands, and teach that Eggman lesson. It's a simple premise, but one with a somewhat environmentalist undertone something certain future adaptations of the property would really lean into, namely the Saturday morning Sonic cartoon. And Sonic, as a character, would show off his too-cool-for-school attitude right away, with his confident smirk and finger-wagging on the title screen. His personality would shine even further in the game itself, where Sonic becomes visibly impatient if the player doesn't do anything for more than a few seconds. You guys have to realize how big of a deal this was back then. Outside of fighting games, idle animations weren't really a standard yet. This was the dev team going above and beyond to showcase the character they had made, and it was little touches like this that made Sonic stand out over Mario. He felt like an actual character, as opposed to just a vehicle through which we play the game, and this was a massive aspect of the game's appeal. As the game itself, Sonic is a platformer much like Mario, following a structure similar to Mario 1 in particular, with a preset order of levels the player must beat, each with three acts and a boss battle. What set Sonic apart, however, was the toolset used to clear each level. There's a much heavier focus placed on building and maintaining momentum. The physics in Sonic are best described as being halfway between a standard Mario game and a pinball table, with Sonic being much more subject to things like gravity and inertia, and it's up to the player to master the controls and mechanics to keep Sonic moving as fast as possible. One of the central goals of the dev team was to make a game that was simpler to control than Mario, but without sacrificing depth of gameplay. Mario games of the time typically had two main buttons, a run or attack button, and a jump button. Sega's AM2 team, now operating under the name Sonic Team, sought to simplify this by making a game that only requires one button to play. Sonic doesn't have a run button, he simply gains speed gradually the longer the player is able to keep him moving. And since Sonic is a hedgehog, he can roll into a ball as a form of both attack and defense, so he doesn't need a dedicated attack button either, just a single jump button, rolling into a ball as he jumps to create his means of attack. Sonic can also roll into a ball while running by pressing down on the D-pad, which protects him from damage and causes him to move at the whims of gravity and momentum. While Sonic has much more control when running as opposed to rolling, running leaves him vulnerable, and his running speed maxes out at a certain point. But rolling down hills and slopes has no such limitations. This also works in reverse though, as rolling uphill will cause a severe loss in speed. Sonic can jump out of a roll at any time, and it's up to the player to decide when it's best to run and when to roll to maintain as much speed as possible. This momentum also applies to vertical movement. Rolling up and down a halfpipe will result in Sonic gaining more speed and height with each pass. If he falls from a great height onto an enemy or item box, the speed of his fall will carry into his upward momentum as he bounces off. This plays into the level design in many interesting ways, perhaps most notably with the catapults in Starlight Zone that you need to use to launch yourself upwards. Add in things like springs, bumpers, and ramps placed throughout each level, and you have a game that's built around reacting quickly to a series of obstacles in order to maintain your speed as long as you can. And little spectacle moments like S-pipes in Green Hill Zone really show off the potential of Sonic's inertia-based movement. And of course, we have these signature loop-de-loops, serving as both a test of Sonic's capabilities and a rewarding moment of snazzy spectacle. All of this was pretty revolutionary stuff for games at the time. Even the greatest Mario games were largely just flat sequences of platforms with very sparse occasional amounts of slopes and verticality. But in Sonic, everything is designed so that the player can go up and down and all around, and even the so-called flat ground has bumps and grooves, always serving as a way to both challenge and showcase Sonic's main gimmick. Drops that would have been instant death pits in a Mario game simply take the player to a slower alternate route instead. Yeah, isn't that ironic? That the franchise built around moving faster would be the one with the more freeform sandbox level design. Basically every level in the game has a top, bottom, and even middle route, and each one is essentially its own difficulty setting. Skilled players will be able to successfully stay on the top paths without falling, and those routes tend to be faster with fewer enemies and obstacles. 
The bottom paths tend to be absolutely littered with enemies and spikes, and sometimes bottomless pits, but are usually less platform heavy and require fewer leaps of faith. In this way, the game rewards high-level play by granting the player a less treacherous trek through the level, while low-level play will tend to be slower and more difficult, but not immediately punishing. And not to mention, there are hidden goodies the player can find by just exploring a bit and playing around with Sonic's moveset. But one should be careful not to dilly-dally. Each level has a strict 10-minute time limit, and failing to finish the level in time will result in losing a life. Every part of this game's basic design is built to encourage the player to keep moving at all costs. Sonic also handles general damage differently than Mario does. Sonic collects golden rings scattered throughout each stage, and while these rings contribute to your score and grant extra lives upon collecting 100 of them, their primary purpose is as Sonic's health gauge. Whenever Sonic is hit, he loses every ring he's holding, which scatter in various directions, giving the player a chance to recollect as many as they can. As long as Sonic is holding at least one ring, he will not lose a life upon taking damage, with the exceptions of drowning, being crushed, or falling into a bottomless pit. This system was likely born of necessity. The game's focus on speed means the player is going to be more vulnerable to tripping up and making mistakes, so this overly generous hit point system gives them several second chances compared to Mario's much more strict two strikes and you're out method. It's also interesting seeing how both these franchises handle water segments. Mario games tend to treat water levels as a sort of set piece. Underwater travel in Mario feels almost liberating in a way, but water in Sonic is a very different story. Every hero has their Achilles heel, and Sonic's is water. The poor guy sinks like a stone, and his greatest strength, his speed, is greatly hampered once he's submerged. But above all else, Sonic can't stay underwater forever. He only has about 30 seconds before he needs to come up for air or find an air bubble to replenish his oxygen supply. This absolutely terrifying jingle begins to play whenever your time is running out, and I'm sure it's traumatized more than its fair share of children. I'm convinced that if you're a millennial with a fear of drowning, there's a good chance that phobia links back to Sonic games somehow. I also have to say, it's weird seeing modern-day Sonic detractors claim that these classic games are difficult or poorly designed, because if you actually go back and read the reviews from back in the day, the most common criticism of Sonic was the exact opposite. The sprawling multi-path level design and the very forgiving ring system, combined with platforming and collision detection that's overall far more lenient than the standard Mario, results in a game that most critics felt was too easy. And while I wouldn't say this is necessarily a detriment to Sonic as a whole, I do agree with this sentiment. 2D Mario games are much more dependent on precision and landing every jump perfectly, whereas Sonic is a lot friendlier on a base level. While the classic Sonic titles never reached the levels of automation that some of the 3D games do, these were never difficult games. So, um, maybe get good, haters. Sonic 1 stands out as being probably the first game built around the idea of speedrunning, before speedrunning was even really a thing. Yuji Naka claims that the decision to make a game about going fast was actually inspired by the first Super Mario Bros. In that game, if you wanted to get to the warp zone to finish the game quicker, you'd have to get through World 1-1 and 1-2 first. And over time, Naka found that he had gotten pretty darn good at getting through those first two levels as fast as possible. So he thought, why not make a whole game that's like that? One where you can essentially skip levels just by learning to play them quickly. And isn't that the core of what speedrunning is? Sure, every Mario level has a time limit, and Metroid encouraged faster play times with alternate endings, but in Sonic, being fast is the whole point. Experienced runs of levels in Sonic can end in well under a minute, and I think this is why the game doesn't include warp points or even a save feature. You may be forced to play the same levels in the same order every time you boot up the game, but you're meant to replay the levels over and over, to get better at them, and see just how fast you really can be. Even casual playthroughs of this game can come and go in around an hour or so, and much shorter than that after enough practice. It's also just kind of a genius move on Sega's part, intentional or otherwise. The Super NES had surpassed the Genesis in basically every technical aspect, except for speed. Having their flagship character revolve around the one major advantage they had over their biggest competitor was a marketing team's dream come true. And if there's one thing Sonic is, it's marketable. Sonic the Hedgehog is, for my money, the greatest mascot character design ever made. A mix of round body shapes with a lot of sharp edges gives a distinct silhouette. His weird mono eye evokes classic 1940s cartoons with their large expressive faces. 
and he's composed of only a few bright, contrasting colors. His design clearly takes inspiration from real hedgehogs without just literally being a drawing of a hedgehog, with plenty of classic cartoon influence to give the character an instantly recognizable and eye-catching design. Sonic is a character who can be sold on Cool Factor alone. You don't have to be a fan of video games to be a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog. And Sega somehow managed to tap into this 90s style without the character coming off as corny. They didn't give him a backwards cap or sunglasses or a leather jacket, they just created a character who came off as carefree and confident. They understood that being cool isn't something you can fake. It has to be genuine, effortless. And Sonic is just that. He's lightning in a bottle, contemporary and timeless all at the same time. So Sonic's spines are not only cool as hell, but also as recognizable as Mickey's ears. This character is one for the ages. Aesthetically, Sonic is one of the most visually striking and distinct games of its era. Backgrounds are abstract, full of life and movement, bright colors, lots of moving pieces. Playing this and then going back to Mario World makes the latter seem so much more flat and barren by comparison. The first level in particular, the iconic Green Hill Zone, reportedly took the longest to finish, with six months of the game's year-long dev cycle being devoted to perfecting it. And it pays off as Green Hill is one of the most memorable opening levels in all of gaming. As much as fans complain about the overuse of Green Hill in more recent Sonic games, there's a reason Sega keeps returning to that well. Because it's fucking brilliant. The level themes in Sonic also don't rely on the standard cliches we had begun to see in the wake of Mario 3. There's the Green Hills and Labyrinth Zone's underwater ruins, as well as Robotnik's factory at the end, but the rest are all pretty unique thematically. Marble Zone combines ancient ruins with underground magma caves. Spring Yard is some sort of nighttime theme park filled with springs, ramps, and halfpipes. And Starlight is a construction site set against a gorgeous starry backdrop. And the music in Sonic needs no introduction. Masato Nakamura would bring his A-game to this project, creating catchy and timeless pieces unique to each stage. He's even said in interviews that he specifically set out to give Sonic a cinematic sound. Mario games tended to cycle through the same handful of tracks over and over, but Sonic made sure each new zone had its own music, something popular platformers to come would learn from. The levels themselves are all very different explorations of Sonic's capabilities, some better than others. Green Hill Zone is a fun little low-risk sandbox, whereas its follow-up Marble Zone honestly plays more like a traditional Mario level than anything. Spring Yard Zone has a couple neat secrets and alternate paths, but maybe a few too many slow-moving platforms for my liking. Starlight Zone is probably my favorite, being a bit of a calm before the storm on your way to Robotnik's factory in Scrap Brain Zone. Labyrinth Zone in particular, placed pretty much right in the middle of the game, is commonly considered the worst level, or at least the hardest. Being a mostly underwater level full of enemies, cramped hallways, and tricky hazards, I can definitely see how it could be a roadblock for most people. Incredibly, Labyrinth was originally planned to be the second level. The developers wanted each level to thematically become more industrialized as you moved toward the end of the game, starting with the entirely natural Green Hill Zone and ending with the completely mechanical Scrap Brain Zone. But Labyrinth Zone was pushed back a few spaces when they realized how much of a difficulty spike it was. And yeah, this was definitely the right call. It's not necessarily a bad level, but it is a claustrophobic and stress-inducing one for sure. Each zone has three acts of gradually increasing difficulty, with every third act ending with a boss battle against Dr. Robotnik in one of his machines. The strategy varies from boss to boss, but they're all pretty simple, each one typically requiring eight hits to defeat. The rings make it easy to just bum-rush your way through these fights, but the actual challenge comes when you try to beat these bosses without losing your rings. Labyrinth's boss is unique in that it's an obstacle course with no need to attack Robotnik at all, and my favorite is probably the Starlight Zone boss which offers two different methods to deal damage, by using the very mines he drops against him, or launching yourself into Robotnik directly. But all in all, none of the bosses are overly impressive or revolutionary, and they're probably the game's weakest element. And I think the real fatal flaw of Sonic 1 is screen crunch. Sonic's sprite is large and detailed and impressive, sure, but it's placed smack dab in the middle of the screen, and given the character's high speed, it's often difficult to see obstacles coming in time to properly react to them. To a first-time player, going fast can often seem like a liability, 
Zooming the camera out or even just panning it back a tad would have been a huge help. The special stages are also probably my least favorite part of the game. Finishing Act 1 or 2 of each zone with 50 or more rings rewards you with the opportunity to collect one of the Chaos Emeralds, and getting all six is the only way to see the game's true ending. The special stages themselves are visually impressive, consisting of rotating stages Sonic must navigate through while in ball form. And these rotating graphics were the closest the Genesis got to competing with Nintendo's famous Mode 7 at the time. These things are great for marketing the game as a state-of-the-art trailblazer, but actually playing them is a different story. I hate these things. They don't usually give me trouble simply because I'm so used to them by now, but they're just frustrating and annoying. And considering there's no Super Sonic yet, and that the good ending is only barely different from the bad one, collecting the Chaos Emeralds isn't even really worth it anyway. I'd recommend new players just don't even bother, unless you end up actually liking these things, you weirdo. But despite my minor gripes, Sonic the Hedgehog would launch to massive sales and critical acclaim. It would replace Altered Beast as the Genesis pack-in title, and before long would blow right past Sega's hope for a million units sold, selling double that by the end of 1991, making it the highest selling video game that year. While Sonic ironically would see only lukewarm popularity in his homeland of Japan, he took the rest of the world by storm, specifically America, the UK, and several Latin territories. This success likely came as a great relief to Sega of America execs, who actually kinda hated the character when he was initially pitched. The Americans would successfully veto a lot of early ideas they thought wouldn't appeal to their audience, such as Sonic having a human girlfriend. But on top of that, they just felt like the character as a whole just didn't really work. Mainly because, and this is reportedly a direct quote from Sega America higher-ups, <clears throat> What the hell is a hedgehog? Nevertheless, the character did prove to be massively popular, and triggered a wave of similar characters. Numerous anthropomorphic animal nobody's ever heard of but with attitude would pop up all throughout 90s pop culture in the wake of Sonic. Like, be honest, how many of you even knew that bandicoots were a real animal? And well, moreover, Sonic himself was just a hell of a lot cooler than Mario. Today, aside from being the internet's favorite punching bag, Sonic is mainly held up as the pioneer of an entire subgenre, the momentum platformer, placing Sonic in the same pantheon of games like Metroid and Resident Evil, a game that redefined established tropes and mechanics to the point of inventing a completely new type of game. But back in 1991, Sonic did something arguably even more important than that. Sonic single-handedly established Sega as a worthy competitor to Nintendo. For the first time since the NES overtook American living rooms, Nintendo now had a giant hedgehog-shaped chink in their armor. The Super NES may have still sold better in the end, but it wasn't the only game in town anymore. Sonic showed us that Nintendo wasn't invincible. Even with the American releases of games like Final Fantasy IV and Super Mario World that same year, Sonic would be the one named Game of the Year by several gaming publications. Which is why I think the Sonic was never good crowd should probably get their heads checked. The Super NES was a response to the Genesis, and Sonic, in turn, was a response to the Super NES. This type of constant, reactionary one-upmanship between the two companies would be the defining element of the 16-bit generation of gaming. Sega would go so far as to actively antagonize Nintendo in their ads, and while Nintendo would normally try to take the high road in this regard, even they couldn't resist firing back on occasion. Never before or since have we seen this level of cutthroat corporate competition permeate through the entire industry the way it did back then. And at the center of it all was Sonic. Regardless of how you feel about Sonic nowadays, regardless of if you think he's a complete joke, if you think his games are trash, if you think the character design is an outdated relic of the 90s, regardless of all of that, he changed gaming forever.